Good afternoon, good morning, good evening, everybody. This is Peter Joseph, December 5th, TZM Global Radio Show 2012. Hope everyone's doing well. Today I'd like to read the second major essay from the 2012 Orientation Guide, which has been trickling out. In fact, a new essay has been posted, uh, the first essay of Part 2, Social Pathology, entitled Defining Public Health. And basically, this essay takes the ultimate measure of society, which is basically our health, and begins to examine components of it from psychological to physiological, drawing relationships and correlations to different social phenomenon that uh, affect it. And I'll leave it at that. Please check it out. All these essays are free online, and they will be eventually turned into a 22 essay, 22 video series once everything is completed, the definitive Zeitgeist Movement series, educational series. Uh, but the essay I want to focus on today is the second major essay of Part 1, which is basically a whole overview section with seven essays, and it's called The Scientific Worldview. So this is a relatively long essay, so I'm going to jump right into this. However, before I do, just a quick update on general stuff. There are roughly 27 new chapters in order for the movement right now. We're going to launch the Global Forum. Ideally, this week, uh, we have one script problem that is in place for this. Uh, and, of course, Z-Day 2013 is going to be a very important subject for everyone. And with the forum help and, of course, the tzmchapters.net site and the work with the global administration team, we're trying our best to really help and assist this year as much as, a, as much as possible to make sure quality events are occurring across the world. The title of the entire orientation presentation, which I hope will carry over in the 2013 Z-Days across the world, will be the Zeitgeist Movement Defined. Uh, seeking a new path of sustainability, realizing a new train of thought. And we're going to be attempting to do a lot of bridging for the main event with other ecological or human rights organizations as well to sort of try to get them on board with a broader view of where these problems are really coming from. But that's for another conversation, and there'll be plenty of time to talk about those issues in future broadcasts. And just one final issue, actually, is the 2013 Zeitgeist Media Festival main event in Los Angeles. We're going to be putting out a big press release for this, uh, I think, this week as well. Uh, that will hit uh, a lot of mainstream outlets. We're doing this through professional services to try and draw on larger talent. However, that doesn't mean uh, we're not looking for every layer of talent, level of talent, excuse me. We're not, you know, obviously larger showcase talent draws a larger audience and creates more awareness. That's part of the point of the media festival. But uh, this really comes down to quality more than anything. So artists out there, if you do visual art, if you do performance art, if you do... Uh, musical stuff, of course, if you do dance, anything, anything that has a social quality to it, uh, this is this is where it comes in. I don't know of any other festival that really takes it on like this. Uh, it surprises me, actually, perfectly frank. Uh, even if you have like ecological festivals and the like, they don't really focus the music usually in that kind of way. So there's a very important element to this for those that get it. Some people still don't really get the media festival, but I hope you do in time. And, of course, you know, keep local stuff going. If you can create a nice event in your area, that's equally as important as the main event. But if you feel like you'd like to come to the main event and perform, uh, you can, you can uh, well, wait for the press release. Just keep that in, your, in mind. I don't want to give out any emails at the moment because none of them have been solidified yet. But uh, we'd love to see some new submissions for talent. There's never any cost to submit. Uh, as far as how people get there and the like, that's negotiated. All of these events are in the, in the red by the end. Uh, it just depends on hopefully not too much being in the red, frankly. But usually some type of general support is given to those that want to come and perform. Um, so anyway, I throw that out there for those that uh, are interested. And since I'm on this tangent, for those that are new to the movement, there are three major public events that happen overall. There's Zeitgeist Day, March of each year. There's Zeitgeist Media Festival, roughly August of each year. Then we have the quarterly town halls, or depending on your how active your community is, monthly town halls. We did a bunch of monthly town halls in Los Angeles for a while, and then we had some issues with location and then scheduling. But we're going to return to do them quarterly, which I think is actually a very good suggestion for anyone out there. And they can take many different forms, by the way. They don't have to be literally town halls in a political sense. We just give it that label. If you want to screen something relevant, if you want to give a small lecture, uh, by the way, if anyone's interested in the lecture team, we still have submissions for that to try and piece this together. Uh, and it's not the easiest thing in the world, but if you do have lectures, please send them to media at the zeitgeistmovement.com so we can review them and figure out how to concoct a lecture team and start to 
make a new layer of activism on this level. Ideally, people would be associated with their chapter. Again, the movement is based on an educational imperative. If we don't have people that can speak and communicate and organize events in all major regions, then there's really no movement, you know, by definition. So I just throw that out there. So the town halls, G days, I guess media festival. This is a, a lot of stuff to keep no. people busy, by the way. So if you run into people in the movement that say, "Well, we don't do anything," or "I don't know what to do," well, they're not really listening or paying attention to what everyone else is doing with respect to these types of actions. So anyway, I'm not going to go on that tangent. I just said. All right. Essay two, from part one of the Zeitgeist Movement Define, Realizing okay, a New Train right. of Thought so Orientation just, Guide. Just, you can see this at the Zeitgeist okay, Movement Global, the Zeitgeist Movement the com. Six, it's entitled, The Scientific World okay, right. making sure it wasn't any confusion. Let's okay, begin with a quote by Michael Polanyi, who is a um, Hungarian polymath, as they call him, a Renaissance man, a very uh, well-known scientific thinker. He states, Almost every major systematic error which has deluded men for thousands of years okay, relied on practical experience. Horoscopes, incantations, oracles, magic, witchcraft, the cures of witch doctors and of medical practitioners before the advent of modern medicine were all firmly established through the centuries in the eyes of the public by their supported practical successes. The scientific method was devised precisely for the purpose of elucidating the nature of things under more carefully controlled conditions and by more rigorous criteria than are present in the situations created by practical problems. Unquote. Generally speaking, the evolution of human understanding can be seen as a move from surface observations processed by our limited five senses intuitively filtered through the educational framework and value characteristics of that period of time to a method of objective measuring and self-advancing methods of analysis which work to arrive at or calculate conclusions through testing and retesting proofs, seeking validation through the benchmark of scientific causality, a causality that appears to comprise the physical characteristics of what we call nature itself. The natural laws of our world exist whether we choose to recognize them or not. These inherent rules of our universe were around long before human beings evolved a comprehension to recognize them, and while we can debate as to exactly how accurate our interpretation of these laws really is at this stage of our intellectual evolution, there is enough reinforcing evidence to show that we are, indeed, bound by static forces that have an inherent, measurable, determining logic. The vast developments in predictive integrity found in mathematics, physics, biology, and other scientific disciplines proves that we as a species are slowly understanding the processes of nature and our growing inventive capacity to emulate, accentuate, or repress such natural processes confirms our progress in understanding it. The world around us today, overflowing with material technology and life-altering inventions, is a testament as to the integrity of the scientific process and what it is capable of. Unlike historical traditions, where a certain stasis exists with what people believe, as is still common in religious-type dogma today, this recognition of natural law includes characteristics which deeply challenge the assumed stability of beliefs which many hold sacred, as will be expanded upon later in this essay in the context of emergence. The fact is, there simply cannot exist a singular or static intellectual conclusion with respect to our perception and knowledge, except, paradoxically, with regard to that very underlying pattern of uncertainty regarding such change and adaptation itself. This is part of what we could call a scientific worldview. It is one thing to isolate the techniques of scientific evaluation for select interests, such as the logic we might use in assessing and testing the structural integrity of a house design we might build, and another, when the universal integrity of such physically rooted causal reasoning and validation methods are applied to all aspects of our lives. Albert Einstein once said, The further the spiritual evolution of mankind advances, the more certain it seems to me that the path to genuine religiosity does not lie through the fear of life and the fear of death and blind faith, but through striving after rational knowledge. 
While cynics of science often work to reduce its integrity to another form of religious faith, demean its accuracy as cold or without spirituality, or even highlight consequences of applied technology for the worst, such as with the creation of the atomic bomb, which, if you think about it in actuality, is an indication of a distortion of human values rather than engineering, there is no ignoring the incredible power this approach to understanding and harnessing reality has afforded the human race. No other ideology, if you will, can come close in matching the predictive and utilitarian benefits this method of reasoning has provided. However, that is not to say active cultural denial of this relevance is not still widespread in the world today. For example, when it comes to theistic belief, there is often a divisive tendency that wishes to elevate the human being above such mere mechanics of the physical reality. The implied assumption here is usually that we humans are more special for some reason, and perhaps there are forces, such as an intervening God, that can override such natural laws at will, making them less important than, say, ongoing obedience to God's wishes, what have you. Sadly, there still exists a great human conceit in the culture which assumes, with no verifiable evidence, that humans are separate from all other phenomena, and to consider ourselves connected or even a product of natural scientific forces is to demean human life. Concurrently, there is also a tendency for what some call metamagical thinking, which could be considered a schizotypal kind of personality disorder where fantasy and mild delusion helps reinforce false assumptions of causality on the world, never harnessing the full rigor of the scientific method. Science requires testing and repeat replication of a result for it to be validated, and many beliefs of seemingly normal people today exist far outside this requirement. Apart from traditional religions, the concept of New Age is also commonly associated with this type of superstitious thought. Now, while it is extremely important that we as a society are aware of the uncertainty of our conclusions in general, and hence must keep a creative, open mind to all postulations, the validity, the validation of these postulations can only come through measurable consistency, not wishful thinking or esoteric fascination. Such unvalidated ideas and assumptions pose a frame of reference that is often secured by faith, not reason, and it is difficult to argue the merit of faith with anyone since the rules of faith inherently refuse argument itself. This is part of the quandary within which human society exists in today. Do we simply believe what we have been traditionally taught by our culture, or do we question and test those beliefs against the physical reality around us to see if they hold true? Science is clearly concerned with the latter and holds nothing sacred, always ready to correct prior false conclusions when new information arises. To take such an inherently uncertain, yet still extremely viable and productive approach to one's day-to-day -day view of the world requires a very different sensitivity, one that embodies vulnerability, not certainty, for one. In the words of Professor Frank L. H. Wolfs from the Department of Physics and Astronomy of the University of Rochester, New York, whose introduction to the scientific method is reproduced in Appendix B of the document, he states, quote, it is often said in science that theories can never be proved, only disproved. There is always the possibility that a new observation or new experiment will conflict with a long-standing theory. Emergence. At the heart of the scientific method is skepticism and vulnerability. Science is interested in the closest approximation to truth it can find. And if there is anything science recognizes explicitly... It is that virtually everything we know will be revised over time as new information arises. Likewise, what might seem far-fetched, impossible, or even superstitious upon its first culmination might prove to be a useful, viable understanding in the future once validated for integrity. The implication of this constitutes an emergence of thought, an emergence of truth or reality, if you will. A cursory examination of history shows an ever-changing range of behaviors and practices based upon ever-updating knowledge, and this humbling recognition is critical for human progress. 
Symbiosis. A second point deeply characteristic of the scientific worldview worth bringing up has to do with the symbiotic nature of things as we know them. Largely dismissed as common sense today by many, this understanding holds profound revelations for the way we think about ourselves, our beliefs, and our conduct. The term symbiotic is typically used in the context of interdependent relationships between biological species, traditionally. However, our context of the word is more broad, relating to the interdependent relationship of everything. While early intuitive views of natural phenomena might have looked upon, say, the manifestation of a tree as an independent ent entity, seemingly self-contained in its illusion of separation, the truth of the matter is that the tree's life is entirely dependent on seemingly external input forces for its very culmination and existence. The water, sunlight, nutrients, and other needed interactive external attributes, if you will, to facilitate the development of a tree is an example of a symbiotic relationship. However, the scope of this symbiosis has become much more revealing than we have ever known in the past, and it appears the more we learn about the dynamics of our universe, the more immutable its interdependence. The best concept to embody this notion is that of a system. The term tree is really a reference to a perceived system. The root, trunk, branches, leaves, and other such attributes of that tree could be called subsystems, relatively. Yet, the tree itself is also a subsystem, it could be said, of perhaps a forest, which itself, of course, is a subsystem of other larger encompassing phenomenon, such as the concept of an ecosystem. Such a distinction might seem trivial to many, but the fact is, a great failure of human culture has been not to fully respect the scope of the Earth system and how each subsystem plays a relevant role. The term categorical systems could be used here to describe all systems, seemingly small or large, because such language distinctions are ultimately arbitrary. These perceived systems and the words used to reference them are simply human conveniences for communication. The fact is, there appears to be only one possible system, as organized by natural law, which can be legitimately referenced since all the systems we perceive and categorize today can only be subsystems. We simply cannot find a truly closed system anywhere. Even the Earth system, which intuitively appears autonomous, with the Earth floating about the void of space, is entirely reliant on the sun, the moon, and likely many, many other symbiotic factors we have yet to even understand for its defining characteristics. In other words, when we consider the interactions that link these perceived categorical systems together, we find a connection of everything. And on a societal level, this system interaction understanding is at the foundation of likely the most viable perspective for true human sustainability. The human being, like the tree or the earth, again intuitively appears self-contained, yet without, for example, oxygen to breathe, we will not survive. This means that the human system requires interaction with an atmospheric system, categorically speaking, of course, and hence a system of oxygen production. And since the process of photosynthesis accounts for the majority of the atmospheric oxygen we breathe, it is to our advantage to be aware of what affects this particular system and work to harmonize our social practices with it. When we witness, say, pollution of the oceans or rapid deforestation of the earth, we often forget how important such phenomena really are to the integrity of the human system. In fact, there are so many examples of environmental disturbances perpetuated by our species today due to a completely truncated awareness of the symbiotic cause and effect that links all known categorical systems, volumes could be dedicated to the crisis. The failure to recognize the symbiosis is a fundamental problem, and once this principle of interacting systems is fully understood, many of our most common practices today will likely appear grossly ignorant and dangerous in future hindsight. Sustainable beliefs. This brings us to the level of thought and understanding itself. As noted prior, the very language system we use 
isolates and organizes elements of our world for general comprehension. Language itself is a system based upon categorical distinctions which we associate to our perceived reality, of course. However, as needed as such a mode of identification and organization is to the human mind, it also inherently implies a false division. Given that foundation, it is easy to speculate as to how we have grown so accustomed to thinking and acting in inherently divisive ways, and why the history of human society has, for a large part, been a history of imbalance and conflict. It is on this level that such physical systems we have discussed come into relevance with belief and thought systems. While the notion of sustainability might be typically associated with technical processes, eco-theory, and engineering today, we often forget that our values and beliefs precede all such technical applications. Therefore, we need our cultural orientation to be sustainable to begin with, and hence we need sustainable values and beliefs, and that awareness can only come from a valid recognition of the laws of nature to which we are bound. Can we measure the integrity of a belief system? Yes, we can measure it by how well its principles align with scientific causality based upon the feedback resulting. If we were to compare outcomes of differing belief systems seeking a common end, how well those perspectives accomplish this end can be measured and hence these systems can then be qualified and ranked against each other. As will be explored in detail later in this text, the central belief system comparison in this text is between the monetary market economy and the aforementioned natural law resource-based economy. At the core of these systems is essentially a conflicting belief about causality and possibility, and the reader is challenged here to make objective judgments about how well each perspective actually accomplishes common end human goals. That noted, and in the context of this essay, specifically the points about emergence and symbiosis, it could be generalized that any belief system that, for one, does not have built into it the allowance for that entire belief system itself to be altered or even made completely obsolete due to new information is an unsustainable belief system, and two, any belief system that supports isolation and division supporting the integrity of one segment or group over another is also an unsustainable belief system. Sociologically, having a scientific worldview means being willing and able to adapt both as an individual and a civilization when new awarenesses and approaches emerge that can better solve problems and further prosperity. This worldview likely marks the greatest shift in human comprehension in history. Every major convenience we take for granted is a result of this method, whether recognized or not, as the inherent self-generating mechanistic logic is found to be universally applicable to all known phenomena. While many in the world still attribute causality to gods, demons, spirits, and other non-measurable faith-based views, a new period of reason appears to be on the horizon, where the emerging scientific understanding of ourselves and our habitat is challenging the traditional established framework we have inherited from our less informed ancestors. No longer is the technical orientation of science demeaned to mere gadgets and tools. The true message of this worldview is about the very philosophy by which we are to orient our lives, values, and social institutions. As will be argued in other essays, the social system, its economic premise, along with its legal and political structure, has become largely a condition of faith in the manner it is now perpetuated. The monetary system of economy, for example, is argued to be based on little more than a set of now outdated, increasingly inefficient assumptions, no different than how early humans falsely assumed the world was flat, demons caused sickness, or that the constellations in the sky were fixed, static, two-dimensional, tapestry-like constructs. There are enormous parallels to be found with traditional religious faith and the established cultural institutions we assume to be valid and normal today. Just as the Church in the Middle Ages held absolute power in Europe, promoting loyalties and rituals which most would find absurd or even insane today, those a number of generations from now will likely look back at the established practices of our current time and think the exact same thing. 
And this concludes the essay, The Scientific Worldview, essay number two, in effect, from the Zeitgeist Movement Define, Realizing a New Train of Thought Orientation Guide. Uh, there are numerous footnotes throughout this essay, which I did not read, of course, but they are important to reference, along with the appendix that was also uh, to be included. It's actually not online yet. Uh, the appendices will be added uh, fairly soon, actually. Some of them will, of course. Not all of them will be available since not all of the essays are fully uploaded yet. But I hope for those that, are, of course, are familiar with the scientific method, really kind of get the point of this with respect to what it really means to have sustainable belief systems. because That's really at the core of everything. So that does it for me. Sorry for the short broadcast. I know it's only a quick little 30-minute thing. But uh, I'll keep coming back and doing these. I think Federico and Ben McLeish, Federico Pistono and Ben McLeish, will be coming back next week. I might be joining them, I'm not quite sure, to have a broader discussion. And we will take it from there. So Zeitgeist Day 2013, uh, hopefully all chapter coordinators and everyone are giving some thought to this at the moment. Uh, this is going to be a, a big deal, so we'll have more discussion on this as well. But I want to continue to reiterate its importance. All right, everybody. Take care. Goodbye.